You've already heard from Thierry Brew this morning. He was on part of the first panel debate. Um, uh, European Space Agency. Thierry, um, please come and tell us a little bit more about the journey of ESA's main control room. Okay. And you have a clicker thing there, sir. This is to go back for us and for okay. Good afternoon. So my name is uh, Thierry Brew and I am uh, working for the European Space Agency in Darmstadt, Germany. And Darmstadt, Germany, this is the place where we are controlling the, the spacecraft that are launched by uh, uh, Ariane Space most of the time, but also we are using uh, Soyuz um, in Kourou and uh, other launchers all over the world, the, the world. So I hope that those that are not there now will be coming and are not having a nap, but we'll see. I would like to start with uh, introducing a bit more what business we are doing, uh, what kind of business we are involved in. That will explain maybe the way we are uh, thinking control rooms and why we are building our control rules the way we are doing. So the European Space Agency um, is the, the gateway to space for Europe, even though the European Commission, since the, the um, uh, so Treaty of Lisbon a few years ago, has declared itself also competent in terms of space domain. But uh, the ESA is, basic, is basically the, 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 the organization that is dealing with space. We have uh, international, uh, we are international organization, and our member states are providing uh, the budget for developing our programs. And when I mention budget, uh, and I did it this morning as well, I'm talking about uh, your taxes, at least the European uh, citizen taxes, including even after the recent Brexit, our colleagues from UK, because uh, UK is a member of ESA, even though they are leaving the European Union. So you see we are the borderline between European and uh, um, extra-European. But we have countries like uh, Norway or Switzerland that are non-European country and are still participating to, to, uh, as a member state. So we have 22 member states which represent about 500 staff and contractors. The main purpose of our business is exploration of space so I don't say that this is a niche domain, but uh, we are trying to do whatever industry doesn't want to do, or is whatever is too expensive for industry to, to develop. Um, you, can, you have heard maybe about UMEDSAT. This is, UMEDSAT is an organization that is um, handling mainly uh, space weather spacecraft. So they are producing all the data that uh, are used to uh, define the weather that you, uh, the weather forecast that you have at the news every day, or um, other companies that are dealing with TV broadcasting, also using spacecraft. But these are, these are basically resulting from the development that ESA did a few years ago. So we are trying to push technologies, and one, once the technologies are um, mature enough to become uh, a business case, then we leave it up to the, to the industry to take over. It nearly did happen with the launchers um, recently when uh, we were um, dealing with uh, Ariane 6 and the companies that, uh, the industry that is providing the launcher themselves said that they could do the requirement and do the development of new launchers um, on their own. Um, so it was a bit like uh, difficult for ESA to accept this kind of uh, statement. But uh, at the end, this is what we are here for. That's why when we have missions like we're sending spacecraft to, to Mars or Venus, this is a domain that the industry is not ready to, to cope with because the initial investment for this kind of missions is quite high. So we are dealing with scientific missions. And for that, um, uh, when you look at the data that we are coming back from, from our missions, we have uh, generations of students that will use this data to, to make their own PhD. So, um, this is this, this way that we are providing a, uh, our participation to the, to the European li life. We are, uh, our headquarters is in Paris, uh, the headquarters is in, in, uh, in Paris, and we have uh, different sites across uh, Europe, including the, the French Guiana. Um, the site that we have is okay, 
I'm talking about uh, Darmstadt, where I'm uh, coming from. We have also in Germany the European the Astronaut uh, Training Center, where they're all uh, training. We have in uh, ESTEC, in, uh, in Holland, uh, not very far from here, we have the research and development done there, and various sites like in UK, uh, Hardwell, in, uh, in uh, Italy, um, uh, Frascati, where we are do doing with the Earth observation data, Spain as well. These are the, the establishment from ESA. Apart from that, we have also ground stations uh, across the world, and uh, like in uh, Chile or um, Australia or in Spain. Of course, we are cooperating with NASA and all the, the all other space organizations to exchange our network of, uh, of ground stations. In terms of budget, this is uh, 7.72 billion per year. These numbers, I must say, were numbers taken before the ministerial of December, um, where maybe, I don't know if you have followed, but the member states have agreed to give ESA a really higher uh, budget for the next five years. So we are beneficial. We will get, of course, this, this budget, increase of budget that will not directly go into our manpower. I mean, the, the complement, the number of staff ESA will have, will be working with is constant, but most of, of this money that is uh, given to us by the member states will go back to the industry. So this is a kind of reinvestment, direct reinvestment to all uh, industrial people that are interested to make business with, uh, with us. To give you another of magnitude here, I gave the, the 12 euro per European per year. This is the amount of money that is coming directly from you. So I should call you stakeholders or partners, I don't know but uh, you are directly involved into, the, into this business. So we have, as I mentioned, we are going to all kind of uh, uh, area in the space uh, sector. We advertise, advertise us as a world leader in science and technology, but I'm pretty sure that others are doing it uh, as well. What is important is that we have developed and tested more than uh, 80 satellite spacecraft since 1976, since 1975, which is the year where ESA started under the brand ESA, which is the, the merge of two other um, agencies before that everybody has forgotten anyway. Um, and we have followed more than uh, 220 launches from the launch uh, port, the spaceport in Kourou, in the French Guiana. So the beneficial for, you, for, for, for our um, business is you mainly. We have recently uh, developed the European GPS, which is called um, uh, by the, um, uh, by the um, by Europe um, in, in Brussels. By the, uh, and this program is funded by, by them. And this is uh, going back to you. This is uh, going to uh, our economy because this money that is invested to ESA is also supposed to go back to, uh, to the industry and more than 80 or 85 percent of our budget is there. Of course, it's our planet because we have Earth observation program that is observing the, 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 our planet and doing the calculation. I mean, how is the ice at the North Pole melting, how fast it is going? When we have um, a flooding somewhere, we can uh, really re react in real time to look at the results and uh, uh, tell the people on the ground uh, where to go to uh, be the most uh, efficient possible. And we are looking also for the, the future. And uh, the future is uh, mainly also going to be uh, uh, space safety, uh, cleaning the space from old uh, spacecraft and also protecting us from uh, external uh, activities uh, like could uh, hurt us or hit us under the, the form of meteor and uh, or other um, solar flares, for example, that we are monitoring as well. Initially in 1975, ESA had 10 member states. These are the member states that are in, in white on this, on this map. And uh, nowadays, we have increased to 22 member states. 
And uh, of course, you see the expan expansion towards the, the, the e our Eastern European countries. And uh, this is, uh, of course, um, not all member states are participating with the same level of, uh, of, of a budget, but they all have a saying. So the way, I mean, I'm not going to enter the details here about the way the programs are done, but we have um, official programs that are compulsory, and we have optional programs. And these optional programs are proposed, or can be proposed by also the smallest country, a member state of, uh, of ESA. And this is the way for them also to return their uh, return on investment from the participation they have to the, to the budget of ESA. So we have our challenges because we are turning towards the universe. I mean, when we talk about the universe, uh, for us, this is the solar system, mainly. We also have to improve the, the Earth on, on life, the life on Earth. And for that, we have, of course, I mentioned that, the spaceport in Kourou, in French Guiana, where we have the possibility to launch our Ian 5 for the time being, Ian 6 soon. In parallel, we might have heard that we are launching also from uh, Russian launchers, the Soyuz. We have a pod, a pad there that allowed us to, to launch with the Soyuz, but we are not launching uh, astronauts with this Soyuz. They are just for uh, standard payload. We also have a small launcher, which is the Vega, for smaller uh, payloads. And the idea here was to be a bit more competitive with respect to what the, the industry or other countries are, are doing. And when you see what Elon Musk is doing today, I think uh, it's also time on this level that we uh, will react and we do something. So here, this is the Ariane 5, and this is the launch of Ariane 5 for BP Colombo. I was mentioning ESTEC. This is a place, ESTEC, where we are doing research and development of our, our programs. But this is the place also where we are testing the spacecraft before sending them out of space. For them, we have, for there, we have uh, in ESTEC, a large chamber that are able to receive the spacecraft. These chambers are um, vacuum chambers uh, to test the spacecraft in a normal environment in the space, but also thermal chambers where you can uh, check the resistance of the spacecraft to, uh, to the heat, to the solar um, uh, 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 heat, also to the vibration. So we have all kind of tests that can be done here at ESTEC. You will have the same type of facility in, in Germany, in Oberpfaffenhofen, with the, the AIBG, uh, where they also test the same satellite, so the same type of test for the satellite. And um, this is here where you see the duality between what we can do and what the industry can do as well. So every time we can promote industry, then we do it. And uh, we try to push the industry to become autonomous into the way they are doing uh, their, their business. Here, testing of spacecraft, it might not be the most obvious one, but this is one example of what we, can, uh, we are doing to promote uh, the, the industry. We take control of the spacecraft, and here what you see is the main control room in Darmstadt. This is the room that we are using for the launches. And this one is the latest version. I will show you later on various pictures of uh, the evolution of this control room towards what we have today. And you can see in the back wall uh, on the top, the number, I mean, all the names of the launches that uh, have been done into that room, and uh, it goes back to the, the, the 70s. So the, um, when you are talking about evolution, conservatism, and uh, uh, resistance to changes, um, maybe here you have a good example uh, of what resistance means. I was mentioning the ground segment, because to communicate to spacecraft, we need to have antennas. And uh, these are the same type of antenna you have to receive your, um, if you have the, the, the chance to have the TV via the, the satellite. You have the dish antennas. The difference between the dish antenna that you have on your roof is the, the size. Here, for example, I think this is in New North yeah. This is um, a dish which is 35 meters. And we have three of these dishes, one in Chile, one in, in Spain, that are at the three corners, if I can say, of, the, of, the, of Earth, so that we can communicate with our spacecraft when they are doing uh, um, deep space missions, like around other planets the, in the solar system. But also, a bit, uh, not necessarily a planet, but we have the example with Rosetta, uh, which uh, did a landing on a comet a few, a few years ago. 
Um, we were using also this deep space system um, ground uh, segment to communicate with them. We have uh, now spacecraft uh, that went around Venus. We have uh, operating spacecraft 24-7 that are around Mars nowadays. And we just landed yesterday, we just started yesterday a spacecraft that is going to orbit the sun during the next, the next uh, 10 years. And for that, we will use this, uh, this ground uh, segment that we can use to cooperate with other organizations like NASA. NASA also has a big um, deep space network. And when need be, we can exchange the, the ground stations and use them in terms of when we have emergency or we, we have the need to. So this is a kind of cooperation that we have with them. Science and exploration, I was mentioning uh, the, the, this with the ground uh, station and deep space antenna. I will not go to the detail here. I will let you have a look later on when you receive the, the presentation. So we have the different uh, spacecraft that we are launched, the one that we are launching and we are operating today. And uh, on the top, you have the spacecraft that will uh, be launched in the next future knowing that Solar Orbiter, that is planned for 2020, has been launched yesterday. So we are already uh, in the future. And this is our universe for, for ESA. We are going to um, uh, the planets that uh, are part of the solar system. When we don't try to reach uh, planets or moons of our solar system, we are trying to do science operations. And for us, science means that we are going to, we are sending telescopes in the space. And these telescopes, so instead of, of course, uh, uh, looking at the, the way telescope owners are doing, we are enlarging and having, looking at a large uh, frequency spectrum that are, this is going from the microwave to the, uh, the gravi gravitational waves, uh, which allowed us to get a new vision about the, uh, the deep space and the, the, the environment that we have. And this is, this is, we're not going there, but this is for us the, the really the, 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 the up, upper limit that we can reach when we are looking at, uh, at space. Here again, the bottom, you, bottom line, you have the, the, uh, the spacecraft that we were launching or we have been launching. Operational, you can see Hubble. Hubble uh, is known as a NASA uh, spacecraft, but this is also uh, program that ESA is, is participating. The, the one that we are doing nowadays is Gaia XMM and Integral. Uh, Gaia being the, the spacecraft that is counting the stars and the order of magnitude of counting the stars is, is, is 100 times more than what has been done so far. So this is to understand the way the stars are moving around us, the way the expansion of the universe and in which direction everybody is going. The uh, missions that are uh, coming soon. Uh, the earliest one is Euclid, I think. And um, Euclid, I mentioned that now because Euclid will be the mission that will be associated to uh, Gaia, XMM, and Integral. And all these four missions will be controlled by the same uh, people. And of course, you cannot, it's not because you have four missions that you will need four people, but the idea here is to go for four missions to only one uh, spacecraft uh, controller. And that's, that's the challenge that we will have to face in our control rooms in the, in the coming years. And that, uh, when I say coming years, this is really uh, starting now. So the science, I, I remind, uh, and, I not, and I mentioned that already before, this is landing on a comet with the Rosetta spacecraft. And more and more, this, this is this number of uh, missions that are lasting quite a long time to reach their target. Between the time you launch a spacecraft and the spacecraft reaches the, 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 the goal, it could be like Rosetta 10 years, it could become a solar orbiter, it could be two years, uh, Bepi Colombo, it would be also three or four years. So the, between the time you start the mission that uh, you are using the main control room and the time you are going to routine operations, you have a certain number of years. So of course, you can think about uh, defining the control room for these routine operations as soon as you launch. But the idea is really to decide later on when you, uh, when you are reaching uh, the operations. And at that moment, you look at uh, how many missions you have to control, what are the, the budget you have, and how you can organize the missions. So here again, this is uh, some pictures of um, 
the missions that we have. We are looking at uh, the sky, at the stars. We are trying to land on Mars. This is ExoMars that is supposed to launch in July. Um, this is also a cooperation with other organizations. And uh, we have, like uh, I mentioned in, in Cologne, we have the astronaut uh, training center. I put here, initially in the, in the picture, I had only uh, uh, Alexander Grest, because it's a German-made uh, uh, presentation. And I'm sorry, I put Thomas Pesquet here, the French astronaut, uh, as such. I don't forget our Italian colleagues, of course, but uh, okay, the place on the picture was, uh, was taken. So, in terms of application, what do we receive? The, the return from not only the scientific, not only the budget, but what the, the European citizen can get as a feedback from, from our uh, operations. We are looking at uh, Earth. So, I was mentioning the, the, the ice at the, the poles. We are looking also at the air quality. We are looking at the, the way the, 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 when we have a kind of disaster, the way for example, in case of flooding, the way the, the water is covering the, 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 the ground and how we can direct, give instruction to the people on the ground to go to the most uh, dangerous places so they can save the population. It's uh, here a, kind of a case of a flooding, a flooded area, but we have also examples when you are talking about volcano, volcano or fires, uh, like in Australia recently, or when we have that in... Um, uh, in various parts of the USA as well. Yeah. We are also monitoring um, the forest, like in Brazil, and uh, raising, of course, uh, alarm or flags when we see that the forest is disappearing, but uh, then it's outside the boundary of our um, uh, dom domain, if you want. All these uh, Earth observation programs are also, like Galileo, uh, developed in cooperation or under the, the, the direction from the European Commission in Brussels. And um, the, the European Commission has uh, developed this, uh, this program, Copernicus is called, uh, to give the European citizens the opportunity to look at the, our environment, to understand our environment, and to possibly react afterwards. So ESA, in that domain, is implementing the programs that uh, the European Commission is, uh, is uh, requesting. In terms of budget, I don't have the number exact on, uh, on the top of my mind, but we are talking about 30% uh, of ESA budget that is coming from uh, the European Commission. So we are also working at different domains like uh, communication. This is Elon Musk was sending his, um, uh, I don't know, 60 or 40 uh, microsatellites to create a network uh, internet on, uh, around Earth. But we are trying to do the same with less spacecraft and working on the uh, laser communication level. Galileo I mentioned. Safety and security also I mentioned. We are looking at uh, meteors that are supposed to hit Earth or we can prevent this to happen or to warn the people before it's happening. We are doing the same also for the, the solar flares, when, uh, when they happen, solar flares can, ha can have a real impact on all the IT infrastructure. And this is something that we try to monitor and warn the people before it happens. So now we'd like to come to the essence, basically. I hope I still have time to the essence of, of my presentation. This is how we, do we control all these spacecraft and uh, how did, what is the path that we were following the last uh, 10 or 20 years to reach uh, what you see today, this main control room and the way it is and why it is like this. So we have two types of control rooms, uh, as I mentioned. We have the main control rooms that is used during launches. This is where the flight control teams is at the top, at top, top level. This is where we have the most of the people and this is where the critical operations are started. So we are using the main control room for launches, but also when we are um, uh, reaching another planet for an orbit insertion, for example, or other critical operations. Here, the control rooms is built up around the flight control team. 
and the systems. So we are looking at the way the people are working inside the room. And um, because the flight control team, they are relatively conservative, the, infrastructure, the way the, control, the consoles in the control rooms in the MCR are organized is basically the same organization that we have since the last 20 years. So we have just followed the evolution of the technology to change from have the evolution of the control rooms, of these control rooms. But in a sense, the way the people are working in the main control room is the same since the, the start of, the, of ESA in 1975. Where we have most of the changes is the, what we call the dedicated control rooms. These are the control rooms where the flight control teams are going when they have finished the launch. This is doing, when they are doing routine operations. For routine operations, basically we don't need to have the entire flight control team. So at the end of the launch, most of the flight control team is going to other tasks, doing something else, other missions, and only the core team is staying um, of engineer is staying uh, in, in, uh, on site. And we have in the work dedicated control room a limited number of people that we call, the, I mean, I'm already mentioning that, the spacecraft controller. And the spacecraft controller nowadays, once spacecraft controller is monitoring, this is why we have that in, uh, in Earth observation, is controlling up to two spacecraft at the same time. So this is, this is uh, due to the automation level that we have in Earth observation uh, programs, it's easy to do, and uh, they are just here to react when something goes wrong. But most of the time, due to the high frequency of uh, passes or above the, the ground station of the, our Earth observation spacecraft, um, we have uh, automated, uh, automated everything, and uh, they just need to here to monitor, and they are working during normal working hours. And this kind of dedicated control room, the way they are organized, is really operation-driven. That is that we have built up the control room, this dedicated control room. The infrastructure itself is made to allow us to have the highest level of conf uh, co configurability and um, to, to, to give us the possibility to evolve in, a, in such a way that we don't have to, in to inject uh, money uh, anymore like we did in the past. When I arrived at, uh, in these positions, each time I had to uh, reshuffle or refurbish the uh, control rooms, I needed to inject uh, 90K or 100K to redo everything, the cabling, the, the, the consoles, the light, and everything. So we try to, to go away from this, uh, this ID, and we have organized the distribution of uh, the power, the data, the light system, uh, in such a way that we can modify the consoles inside the room whenever the, the team is changing the functionality of the way they are working. So we need now, uh, okay, we don't, we don't need to, uh, to do that. We, don't have, we cannot do that in two, two days or, or one week. We need that sometimes, but the flight control team is able to, to come to us and tell us, okay, this is the way we want to, to work in six months from now or in five months from now, and they give us the plan of, of their, the way they are working, and then we, we organize a room um, according to this, to this plan that they bring to us trying also not to impact the operation because this is the room where they are working. So like, like in a air traffic control, we try to do the modification without impacting the, uh, the operation. So here are some, like we saw before, some pictures of the first main control room in the 60s. We had, um, you see, the, 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 you recognize the technology. The, the telephone is still with the, the quadrant and returning ones. We have still the, phone, the telephone, but the idea is still there. It is already there. The way to do operations is already into these pictures in the 60s. And uh, the dedicated, dedicated control room, we are following the same, the same mentality, the same way of, of working, where you had the operator in a, in a row facing uh, a wall where you had the, the, the map of where the spacecraft used to be or will be. Then in the 70s, they said, okay, we try to do something else. Um, we, we need more space because we have uh, the flight control teams are, are larger. Um, but still, uh, with, and they try to show more information on the wall. Um, and you see the consoles, the way they are organized. The consoles, they still have the computers inside. And these computers inside the consoles with the, the, the monitors, also the TV, or CRTs, they need to be cooled down. So this uh, kind of uh, control rooms, I don't say it's, uh, it's not good to work there, but they were not adapted to the human being working in the room. They were built up to accommodate the, the equipment and the technology. 
In the 80s, the people were a bit more thinking about, okay, how do we work inside the room? And you see they are not anymore working in a row, uh, like in front of or behind each other. They are uh, working, you have this uh, horseshoe or this circle in the front where the, the flight control team or the engineers are all sitting together. In terms of communication, then you had a change in the way the people are working. But still you have the, um, the big CRT's monitors and the big consoles, like here. In the 90s, you, uh, you will change a little bit. You have more, more people working in the room. The room is larger. This room was made to control more than one spacecraft for the launch. We had this for the, the, the cluster missions. And, um, the, but the idea is always the same. You have in the back row the flight director. And in the front row, you have the, the engineers from the flight control team. And in the middle, you might have the spacecraft operation manager that is here to make the interface between the flight control team and the flight director in the back. In the year 2000, you are going to tell me there is not a big change. The, the big change here is the monitors. They are not CRTs anymore, but they are LCDs. Nevertheless, you can see the space that is allocated for the operator. The keyboard takes all the space. The intercom uh, system is, is there in the middle of, uh, of the positions. You cannot work with documentation here. You are, you, you are just here to work with the computer. Now the, the people have changed, and uh, we try to give the operator more, uh, more space. And this is the latest version that we, we have developed. You can see that uh, the, um, the CRTs, now the monitors, are re being replaced by flat panels. And we are getting rid of all these big consoles that we used to have in the past. You can you maybe see in the middle here, this is the only place where we put uh, electronic equipment. We have uh, virtualized our uh, IT environment, so we don't need to have cooling system in the control rooms anymore because these thin clients have uh, just electronic boards and don't need to be cooled down. So we have more space to the, given to the operators. As you can, you can see, they can bring their laptop, they can bring their documentation. And also, the way we have lowered the, the consoles allowed a better communication between the, the people. Um, usually, they, um, when you do operations, you have to go through the voice loop to, uh, to do the communication because everything is recorded. In time, uh, there is a problem. We need to be able to uh, go through what did happen. And, and here we have headsets that are wireless, so that allow the people also to move around the console. So they need this degree of freedom to go around and, uh, and doing operation with the, the colleagues. So we have, of course, the official way to go through the voice. That is a the first level of communication. But the second level of communication is direct linked with the people face to face. And sometimes they, they succeed to solve issues face to face faster than through a uh, a communication like, uh, like the voice that we have. So the future tomorrow. We have already mentioned maybe um, uh, we are going to have this kind of uh, uh, monitors that are uh, not uh, physical anymore. We don't know what, what it will be, but we are going to, to work on it. And uh, we have put together some requirements uh, in terms of function, in terms of operational requirement, ergonomical uh, requirement, and also new e technology requirements. So here we are trying to tell the operator, look, this is what the technology today allowed us to do. This is the technology where with the technology that you find in the industry. This is the way your console, your operator position can be. What do you think about it? Can you adapt to this technology? Can you change the way you are working or can you Work, continue to work the way you are working, but adapt to this technology and take the benefit of this technology. So the functional requirements are basically the same. You need to, to have space for, to, to work, and we have to follow uh, ergonomical requirement. Operational requirement, this year we are talking about communication when we have a, a, a launches, how the people are communicating together, what are the group of people that are in the room together, and what is the importance of them to communicate between them. Ergonomical requirements, these are standards. We try not to uh, forget about the operator position that you're sitting 24-7 uh, on front of his desk. And we are trying also to take on board new technology come head-up display for virtualization, virtualizations or holography, why not? 
um, to enhance the, the way uh, the operator can be working. Before we get up, we are trying to put together, and this is my last uh, slide, we try to put together a, um, a kind of a simulation of a demonstrator of a control room where we will put together all this information that we gather. We are uh, de facto working with CAD CAD work for, for this uh, work and we are also in involving uh, Astrid for the ergonomical aspect because what is important is if we bring or if we are trying to ask the operator to do something with this new technology that is now available, we need also to involve them from the beginning uh, to participate to this, uh, to this design. And this is what we try to do with this, uh, the, the demonstrator. And the results that we expect to have are, are really um, not tomorrow, for tomorrow, because we have uh, for 2021 at the horizon 2021, 2022, we want to, uh, we have the request from our missions to change the way the operations are done. I mean, I was mentioning uh, Euclid, Gaia, XMM Integral. These are four missions that are now are going to be controlled together by one operator only, uh, which is a challenge because the information, the amount of information that this operator is, will need is, is, is tremendous, but uh, for him to work, he will need to work on the essential only when something is happening. We have also the same, the same requirement from our uh, operator that are controlling the ground uh, antennas, where they have, um, in average, seven to eight antennas to monitor uh, for the, all the passes, the configuration of the antenna for all passes when the spacecraft needs to co communicate. And for this, we went from six operators 24-7, and nowadays we have two operators 24-7. So the same amount of information needs to be treated, but we have less and less people. And these challenges we're trying to do, and this control room, I mean, this demonstrator, hopefully, will uh, help us uh, in the future. I am finished, so I can... Thierry, thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, Thierry. <clears throat> Fascinating. Uh, do we have any questions at all about the European Surveys Agency? At least any questions that would make sense? The one makes sense. Though. No, you see, I, you, you, you've blinded us <laughs> with the science, and that's probably fair enough. Um, uh, thank you very much indeed. Are you around yeah. for the rest of the day? Um, yeah. should, should anyone want to have a, a conversation? Yeah, we'll be around, yes. Okay. So, again, Thierry, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you.